Today's special guest on The Chattering Hour is Lou Temple. You might know him from his recurring role on TV series such as Longmire and Wicked City, and most recently as Axel in season three of The Walking Dead. He's also done genre favourite films such as Rob Zombie's The Devil's Rejects, Halloween and 31, and he appeared in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Beginning. Up next on The Chattering Hour, actor, producer, sometime baseball player and all-round nice guy, Lou Temple. And we're back with our special guest, Lou Temple. He started his working career as a baseball player playing for teams such as the Seattle Mariners and Houston Astros before turning to acting. He's worked with directors such as Rob Zombie and Tony Scott multiple times and recently with Quentin Tarantino. In 2017, he was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Gulf Coast Film and Video Festival. Lou, thank you very much indeed for joining me here today. So good to be here, Nick. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to have a visit with you. It's been a while since we've talked, and uh, uh, it's great. Technologically, we can do this. And uh, uh, congratulations uh, on the success of the Chattering Hour. And after this last two years, we've needed it. You've served a lot of uh, resource for all of us as an audience, for sure. Thank you very much indeed. That's that's very good of you to say. Thank you. What I wanted to do is actually is take you right back to um, the very start. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? Yeah, I'm uh, New Orleans, Louisiana, and uh, grew up there in the swamps in the south, and then uh, uh, kind of traversed into college, into Florida, and then transitioned into Texas and lived a lot of life in Texas. So I've definitely got that Southern sensibility woven in. And, um, and then I mixed it up with a lot of travels. When I get to Europe, I feel like it's home. I think there's so much European sensibility in native Louisiana and New Orleans that, uh, that it's very natural to, to, go to Europe and feel like you belong there, or that's at least where you came from, for sure. And then Texas has this great sort of can-do spirit, which I imagine is, you know, started uh, from, from, from your land, you know, mm. from the United Kingdom and going out and, and seeking and, and foraging and, you know, conquering, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes. so, yeah, yeah. So what what was your childhood like? What sort of thing, you know, what was a great day when you uh, were a kid? What, what did yeah. you get up to? So that's a great question. And it just goes back to what I always ask every child. What is your passion? And mine was baseball, a uh, our, our national pastime uh, here in the States. It's being played all over the world now, but uh, we like to think we invented it. Although there's a lot of argument that... Uh, that it's a form of rounders actually that came from the UK, as you well know. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, but baseball, I loved it. I think I was introduced at the age of eight through my grandfather. And it's just one of those things that stuck with me in, in participating and playing. And I just did it uh, every waking hour. And I didn't really get distracted from my baseball enthusiasm. And at night I would read baseball books and, there was ever anything baseball in magazines certainly newspapers uh, the events of the games every morning um, occasionally I would get to see a game on television and then there were more broadcasts and I was very active in watching and I would take you know fastidious notes of what happened during the game as if uh, you know I would study those and help me go play I collected all sports specific to baseball paraphernalia baseball memorabilia uh, and that took me all the way through high school where I eventually got a 
a scholarship to go on to college and play and followed that all the way through college to where I was uh, selected to play professionally in the minor leagues as a minor league baseball player and played to the probably beyond my abilities to be honest with you, Nick, but um, finally they, they caught on to me and said, oh, we've got better players than you. We're going to ask you to quit or actually we're just going to, but we'd like for you to stay around and be part of the organization. So I started coaching and then actually being a talent scout looking for players. And, and, and so my whole career into my mid twenties was entirely baseball as was my passion. And to be honest, it still is. I mean, if someone asked me, I would say baseball is my first love and continues to be. Uh, I happen to, well, having a great job, making a, you know, a yearly salary, which was very good, expense report, company car, being a single man, I followed a young lady into a building to possibly uh, uh, chat her up for a, a dinner, and it ended up being a theater Nick and they were doing theater in front of me and I thought oh my gosh look at what I can do that there's my people uh I don't know why it struck me that way I think basically kind of Louisiana is theater of life always you're kind of singing for your dinner continually and I thought well that's something I can do and uh and I couldn't to be honest but it, it was it was planted in me and I started to sue it in in study in in my friend, uh moonlighting if you will and um, at some point a decision was made for me yet again the organization that I was working for the professional sports team uh, a guy a, a particular gentleman Bob Watson he said look I, I think there's something burning in you and if if you don't pursue it you'll always regret it so I'm going to fire you <laughs> and he fired me uh, and then I started pursuing acting by going back to school in Brooklyn College and learning that trait on stage. Long answer to a short question. My apologies, <laughs> Nick. That's, that's, that's absolutely fine, but I do want to un unpick a couple of things. So you're playing baseball all the time. You're out every night. Did you go to the cinema? Did you watch films or TV much? Just... Uh, 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 maybe recreationally occasionally it certain wasn't it wasn't my go-to and it wasn't something that uh was stirred in me as a child i watched i watched television for sure you know as and and i enjoyed it i enjoyed our our sitcoms mm -hmm. uh which really were situation comedies then a uh, half hour with laugh tracks uh, I thought those were fun. I was captivated by shows like the Six Million Dollar Man, um, Wonder Woman, uh, just sort of the supernatural aspect of those. I never thought, though, Nick, that there was something known as an actor. I didn't actually know or take the time to consider that those weren't those people weren't real. So. Maybe I thought Lee Major's real name was Steve Austin, and he really did have bionics, and how cool is that? It took me a long time to kind of wrap my head around, these people are pretending, these people are playing these right. roles. And so, it, no, if you're asking, did I have a always great imagination, I think in my imagination, I, I won a lot of games by myself hitting home runs in my backyard or on a playground. Uh, I came up against the best competition and I overcame it. So I think that imagination helped me um, in what I do now, sure. because that's maybe my strongest trait is you, the use of my imagination or for any actor, to be honest. Right. Uh, but I didn't consider, oh, I'd like to be an actor. That just wasn't even, you know, that that was very foreign to me. It, right. If I can, if I can use that term, and it it didn't dawn on me until I walked into that theater at the age of twenty seven that that was something someone could pursue as a vocation. Uh, 
which was even crazy then. It wasn't even that I wanted to do that then. I, I, but I think always in me, I will say this, to be honest, I was always a class clown. Uh, I always was maybe the loudest voice in the room, even though the littlest guy physically. Uh, I was always uh, brazen to put forth and do an impression in front of the school assembly or tell a joke. I, I did have a lot of storyteller innately in me. So I think that's what was trying to get out in some form or fashion and, and organization, maybe harnessed towards the theater, yeah. So how old were you when you kind of thought, right, this is something you, you've just been let go. This is what I'm gonna do next. So how yeah. old were you then? I was 27, 28 years old, about essentially a year later. Uh, huh. And so that would be really late in the the ideals of a pursuit of being an actor that goes to work every day, mm. one form or another. And so, but I want to make sure everyone knows it's never too late. Like this is uh, the story of your life is always alive. And that's, that, that's what's, you know, great about what we do. And I had had so much rich experience in life through my efforts of being a baseball player, traveling, uh, you know, being, in a commune of 25 other guys playing on a team, the team concept, uh, winning, losing, uh, getting hurt, uh, friendships, uh, not friendships, you know, meeting people on the road, saying goodbye, all those things brought a richness of life, which I used always uh, in my work. So I would say, did I get, I did get a late start, but I've used it. I also was, one of my other skills besides imagination is awareness, acutely as a physically, uh, you know, I, I, I was always physically weaker than the rest of, by the time I was playing professionally, cause I'm, you know, I'm 5'10", 160, and these guys I'm playing against are six foot, 200 pounds. So I had to, observe I had to mentally be tougher I had to do a lot of little things to overcome the physical limitations that I might have had as a professional athlete and one of those things was being heightenedly aware of the situation of my surroundings of the environment of projecting what's going to happen next or a, 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 you know 40 minutes down the road and that's another great skill that I use today um, right. So I recognize getting a late start, I aware, using my awareness, knew I had to get going and hit the ground running. And how could I take shortcuts? How could I? And one of the shortcuts was to use my life experience as great service to whatever story that I was telling. Mm -hmm. I also, I knew that we, we lose a lot. So the rejection aspect of acting wasn't going to tear me down as much as somebody that hadn't experienced anything more than uh, she turned me down on a date. You know, I, I had had a lot of rejection. Um, you know, I'd failed to win a lot of games. So I understood that. And I think, I think that served me really well. And then recognizing too, that it's an evolution and you're always learning and how can I continue to learn? Uh, but a certain immediacy, immediacy to my learning curve. I needed to learn fast and I, I, I focused. And, uh, and so I think, I think too, I'm really good at, on set. I'm really focused and I, I'm alert and that's important. The things that worked against me, Nick, in that regard in athletics. So for instance, football, as you call it, mm -hmm. or, uh, or tennis, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, rote, there's, there's a lot of skill uh, rehearsal. So you're always practicing, you're always getting better or the or playing the piano, a musical instrument, doing scales, the 10,000 hours, if you will. And that's not really actually something that I find to be serviceable in acting. Do you understand? It's mm. the, being organic in the moment as opposed to saying, learning your lines forward and backwards 100 times so that when you say it, it just sounds like you are just exactly saying it. That, that didn't serve me. I had to overcome that, uh, you know, need 
to practice, need to rehearse. I, I should go over my lines. Somewhere you know them and put them down. What's your saying? Uh, you know, put your pen down, walk yeah. away. Yeah. Uh, change is as good as a rest. Yeah. You know, go yeah. take a nap. Take a yeah. nap. Yeah. I've, I've always believed in going, going away in order to come back. For just sure. Most, like, yeah. It's just not going anywhere. I'm just going to take a five minute walk or something just so I can approach things with a fresh pair of eyes or just. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So what was your first professional acting role? Oh, it was very interesting. So, you know, and now I'm acting and I'm, I'm really just doing garage theater as we call it over here in the States, but it's, it's well below a level of, uh, well, it's community theater essentially. And, um, I, I was always rather quirky. I think my, th th this is in the day when we were really stereotyping our uh, aesthetic. And so for me being in Texas at the time, which was considered a Midwest market, um, the aesthetic was very clean cut and rather, uh, well, how would you say it? Uh, reliable or honest. And I just have one of those faces that can maybe go the other way. And so nobody was interested in hiring me to pitch their product in commercials, by the way. Uh -huh. This is where you started in our, in our, the market that I was in. I really right. needed to be on one of the coasts. I needed to be either West Coast, Los Angeles, or East Coast, New York, where, where their ideals, their viewfinder was much wider berth. But a guy came in from New York City to cast a commercial. And uh, he cast me and it gave me like this validation. Oh, I, somebody would pay me and really hire me for a commercial. And, and that gave me a lot of spirit and confidence that I can do this and get paid or I can do this and somebody will select me. I'm not the last guy picked on the playground anymore. And um, that, that was very serviceable. It was a, it was a, local commercial it just market it wasn't that big a deal <laughs> director from new york city who was a big deal matthew harrison and i'll always be grateful to him had chosen me uh did a lot for my my confidence shortly thereafter a television show by the name of walker texas uh headed up chat called me director was very effusive like blue temple where have you been i'm very happy to meet you and you're doing a nice job on the, this audition we're going to hire you and i I did a few years on, on that show and then ultimately did get invited to work at the, the rep house in Houston, Texas, known as the Alley Theater, uh, which is an equity lord house. And then uh, I was kind of on my way, just staying in Texas, doing local hire type roles on film. Television wasn't as active, but it was kind of the birth of independent film in in texas with robert rodriguez and richard linkletter so i was i was parlaying with them on projects and it was really great and then my girlfriend dumped me there we go it's always about a girl or such relationship and the guys that i was working with said you got to come to los angeles buddy you can work out there and that was the year 2000 and so i did and uh and it didn't just happen. I had to come back to Texas for a year or two to, to secure work. But finally, um, I was able to do that. And one of the first, I think the biggest Los Angeles opportunity was The Devil's Rejects. And the casting director, Monica Mickelson, was casting for Rob Zombie's Devil's Rejects. And I had liked horror films, Nick, but I wasn't an enthusiast. So my horror films might have been more of the Hammer films, the creature features. Um, I certainly knew Dawn of the Dead and, and The Hills Have Eyes, those kinds of movies, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre for sure. But, but I certainly wasn't as well-versed as a lot as you or a lot of your, uh, a, a lot of your audiences. And so The Devil's Rejects caught me off guard when I read that script and I was a little nervous. And then it came to be that Rob had selected me. And so I called a friend of mine, Walton Goggins, who had done his first movie, House of a Thousand Corpses. And I said, uh, you know, hey, Rob, uh, Rob's hired me, Walton. And uh, I don't know if I can go work for this devil worshiper. 
<laughs> and he said, oh, come on, do yourself a favor, you idiot. Go do the movie. You'll have a great time. It'll be great work and you'll have a friend for life. And, and truer words have never been spoke. So that was kind of my wind in my sail for Los Angeles because there were some really cool people like Jeremy Davies and Steve Zahn that were reading for that Adam Banjo role. So again, you know, small successes lead to bigger confidence, right? Right, right, right. What's the, I've heard other guests talk about working with Rob Zombie and, and for sure. in such gl you know, glowing terms. Um, so what, what was it physically like working on the set? Because I mean, you're out in the, you know, small mode, because this is all shot on location, I guess. Yeah, that's a great question because everyone, well, what's it like working with Rob Zombie? And, and your question leading is physically, what's it like? If it's mm. like physical work. It, it, it is hammer and nails, it is cement, uh, because it's re he requires authenticity. And, and the thing I say about Rob, he knows what he wants and he wants what he knows, there's no, there's no gray in there. And he knows because he's a performer, what's real and if anything's false, he calls cut right now. And sometimes reality requires a lot of blood, sweat, sweat, and tears. The great thing about Rob, you know, you always hear about, I want this to be a safe environment where you can feel comfortable with your emotion. You know, he doesn't want any environment safe. He wants it exactly unsafe. He wants you to be a little nervous, a little afraid of the situation, which entirely shows in something like a hostage situation in a small motel room. Uh, to where, you know, he comes to me and he says, Lou, if, if you saw one of your friends get executed, what would you do in the moment? And I said, I'd probably uh, react. I'd vomit. And he said, perfect. Uh, let's get some potato soup in here. And, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, that kind of thing. The, the scene with Otis and Adam, or Bill Mosley, is a lovely, amazing artist and actor and dear friend you know that was three days for him cutting my face off and they were pumping so much blood through me and it was so hot in palm day it was 100 degrees in this wretched chicken ranch where the stench was just vile and the heat was oppressive and and we're sweating and i keep you know i've got blood in my face and my eyes and it's burning and i'm i'm frustrated and i'm angry we continue to do this take and so i'm spitting blood into bill's face which then this blood's getting in his hair, which requires him to get clean after every take, which is another 20 minutes out in the sun. Oh, and he was so angry at me and I was so angry at him. I apologize for this helicopter blowing by. Oh. But you see Rob, Rob mandated, he, he, he puppet mastered all of that. So it's so visceral and real in those scenes and that struggle, that struggle for life is, is real. And, and that's what he gets in his moments and and you know this and you've had guests from rob's ensemble when you come in to work for him you know to bring it you know to bring that that's not job rob rob does not want to give you a character he does not want to give you notes he'll let you know if it works or it doesn't work and he'll take the blame if it doesn't work it's my camera it's my lens let's set up a different shot you know he, he he's like a great coach he takes the fall for for something that doesn't work and really most times it's it's your bad decisions bad use of your talent uh so but i i really trust his storytelling nick i because he is a storyteller because first and foremost he's he's a fan uh, and he knows story and he's just gotten better at telling story and he knows and he's been on stage. If you've ever seen him in concert, you know, he gives everything he's got. And it's way more than you ever purchased. I have to say it's incredible. And so uh, so it, it, in the confines of the day, you get all of this from Rob Zombie and then you get a chum at lunch that's telling some jokes or asking you about, you know, your family or having this conversation you and I are having right now. And it's great. He's great, but it's a day of work. Make no mistake. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's, that is fascinating. That is really interesting to know. Now, one of the next films that you then went on to do, funnily enough, was another horror film, and that's Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Beginning. 
Now, this is directed by uh, Jonathan Liebsman, and I think this is possibly his second or possibly, yeah, second major film that he's that he's done. What, what was that experience like? Well, it was it was for for me because I was going to work in the in the setting with uh, Arlie Ermey, who's passed away, God bless, and uh, Andrew Bernarski, whom I had known. So we were kind of the three uh, veterans on set, if you will. And I so enjoyed, you know, working with mates. Uh, but the rest of the set was very young and very energetic and very, uh, uh, you know, in the now. They were cool kids. Interestingly enough, I had done, I had done Streetcar Named Desire at the Alley Theater, and one of our young boys that came in to deal with Blanche at the end of the play was a little twelve-year-old named Matt Matthew Bomber, who of course ends up being lovely. And I reminded him on set, "Hey, we worked together like when you were a boy, and now he's a man doing this beautiful role." Um, so. Our work was really kind of dialed in with our experience. You know, we were real easy with our work. Sometimes when you work with young people, there's a lot of uncertainty and you got to take care of them and take care of yourself. And, hey, it's okay, you're doing great. Or, yeah, that's an interesting choice. It might not work so much here, but I like where you're going. Let's modify. You know, I mean, but when you work with old pros, it's pretty, it's pretty smooth, you know, and, uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna pass you the ball and you kick it and score. Uh, Jonathan wanted me to improv quite a bit because he thought it would lend itself to the colloquial tone of the of, of the movie. So we are in this car driving, Arlie and myself and Jonathan and his cameraman, and I'm just going off about the the economy of the day and you know I'm moving to Michigan after I take care of this little situation and it was really a lot of fun um and then when I saw the movie it was as violent it was so much it was so violent I couldn't believe it scared me it was so violent I hadn't thought that the devil's rejects of course it was but that it was that violent so uh I was my eyes were really opened after I sat in the theater and saw that movie <laughs> holy cow and uh it was kind of the sign of the times. We were really getting into heavy, hardcore. I'm going to show you the violence. I think we did that up to a point through all of our hostels and all of our purges. And now I think it, it skewed a little bit, bit back to the psychological tear. What I want you to ask about next is um, about a couple of films that you did with the great Tony Scott. Uh, um, right. Kind of kind of do it back to the front um unstoppable um you've got such yeah. a lovely part in unstoppable but you it previous did. you previously worked with him and i believe uh denzel washington um on deja vu, vu so did the one did unstoppable just come out of deja vu how did it all happen you know it really all happened to one before deja vu which is domino interestingly enough Oh. And Domino is uh, is Kira Knightley, Mickey Rourke, Edgar Ramirez. We've got Chris Walken. I I mean, we've got Brian Austin Green and Ian Zering. Um, so Domino was Domino Harvey, which is uh, uh, your Mr. Harvey's daughter, and it's about a, a bounty hunter. And uh, it was great. And so I had come in to audition for a casting director, Denise Chamian, who kind of knew a little bit about me, but not a lot. And she had enough courage to bring me in in front of Tony for this role. And the role required, or ultimately, I'm going to end up losing an arm in the role. So I actually had a prosthetic stump built and a, a shirt that it, it, I kind of uh, showed up without an arm and I think he was embarrassed that <laughs> that he might not have known I was handicapped and then I was embarrassed to not let him know that I really wasn't um, 
have this disability. But anyway, it was a great audition. He loved my enthusiasm and he hired me. And then over the course of the shoot uh, that we shot in Las Vegas for three months, um, you know, with Mickey Rourke and, and Kira Knightley, she was just still a child, I think, at 19. Uh, it was just fantastic. And it was as big and as action driven as I'd never you know, I'd never been on a set like that where, you know, when you work with Tony Scott, you're working with one of the lions and I just fell in love and his enthusiasm. So infectious. Anyone would do anything. He was like working for Willy Wonka. I always say it was just amazing. And like your favorite uncle or your favorite cousin, you just, you loved him and you, you'd do anything. Everybody moved for him at, at a, at a trot and uh, yes, sir, boss can do, will do. And, and his shots were huge and cameras and helicopters and he'd made epic movies and was continuing to do so. So I had had that experience with him. And so he knew me and he's making deja vu. And I'm like, wait, I'm not in deja vu, but Tony, you and I, we have this, you know, love affair, what's going on? And I went to New Orleans to see him and to call him out. And he said, he was surprised to see me. I showed it and he said, look, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, I, I can't use you in every movie, mate, but I'll use you where I can. And nobody had ever told me something like that before, that it wasn't that a director didn't like me. It's just that you don't always fit in every movie. And that, that was great advice because it took away that, why isn't Rob using me in this movie or why isn't? And lo and behold, uh, two months later, he called me and used me in Deja Vu in a great scene with uh, Denzel Washington where Denzel's stealing my, uh, my ambulance, you know? And I tell him, look, it never turns out the way you think. And it's, it's kind of a movie, movie about predicting the future. And he says, well, don't I know it. It's, so it was great. And then when Unstoppable comes around, I've got, you know, I've got this, time in this second hand with Tony and he, he brings me in and for his producers I have to audition and that's okay and you know he's like yeah yeah that's what I want I want Lou to do this role and it's so interesting Nick where I land the character very uh, evidently in the front with bravado and and, you know, you really get a sense of who this guy is. Then by nature of the script, the character's kind of buried in the middle. And, and then at the end, he's brought back as, as one of the heroes to help save the day. And, you're, and, and immediately, you're, oh, that guy. Oh, yeah, that guy. He landed all the way in the front. And Tony, I knew that I could do this, but it wasn't so much in the script built that way. And Tony kind of gave me free reign to try that. And his brother Ridley at the at the premiere told me as such a kind compliment, you know, you've really done a, a job here because you've been an island unto yourself a lot of times by yourself in the cab of a truck, building a more a memorable character that sticks with us through the movie and then pays off at the end. So much so, Mr. Nick, that Quentin Tarantino never forgot that role. And he never forgot that character so that he called me in personally in building once upon a time in Hollywood to talk to me about that role and that character and that service. And then to tell me all about like yourself, my career and all these movies that he'd seen me do and then hired me for once upon a time in Hollywood and recently still talks about with that movie, Unstoppable, one of his five favorite and speaks to it like, yeah, that movie's, uh, Lou Temple steals the show from, and I, you know, I'm not boasting here, but, but I am, let's be honest, um, that it served in so many ways. And when we lost Tony, so just painfully, I was on the set of The Walking Dead and, uh, and I was alerted and I, I just wanted to leave for the day and I was, I was told by somebody who had also worked with Tony, said, Tony wouldn't want that. Tony would want you to finish the day. And I kind of put the, 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 the pain and the frustration of his, his suicide on this young 
a wonderful actor, Andrew Lincoln, one of your countrymen. And uh, that wasn't fair. And it was too much. And this guy, he's trying to, you know, hold it, this show together and deal with me in this moment. And it was really great. He said, it's great. It, it ended up not making the cut of the television show. But oddly enough, it was a scene about the loss of, of one of my friends on the show, uh, Oscar, who was played by Vincent Ward. And I just was transcending the loss of Tony into that scene. It was heavy. It was heavy, I have to say. But uh, thank you for bringing Tony up. Probably my favorite uh, large movie that I've ever done as far as a studio picture. Uh, the experience of having done it, the working for Tony, the excitement, and then the end product. It still holds up today. It still played all through the pandemic. Keeps you on the edge of your seat. Very little CGI. Uh, we used real trains. It was real work. And I'm so proud to have been a part of it. And interesting at the red carpet, Denzel Washington said, what are you going to do now? And I said, I'm going to go watch the movie. What about you? He says, nah, I've seen the movie. I'm going to go watch the Lakers. That's not what I mean. He said, you've got 10 days. Your life's going to change in Hollywood. You better know what you're going to do. Also, you know, lovely that awareness that I heard that and, and was set up to, to handle that. So very interesting. Ah, well, I, I, for those of you who haven't seen Unstoppable, I have to say one of my favorite scenes in the movie is one of your earliest, where you're in the diner. Because Yeah, that was so great. It, it is beautifully directed and written and performed by yourself, so also with the lady Thank playing the, the waitress yeah. in front of you, because you know this guy. You yeah. know exactly who this guy is within like 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, and and it, yeah. it all pays off when he's, you know, he feels the glow of the shiny lights at the, at the press conference at the end. He'll take, take all the credit. You know, he was going to take the credit right there. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it was so great because Rosario Dawson, who's, who's lovely came in to read lines off the script on the telephone that day. She came in, she didn't have to do that, you know, and that was so great. Uh, and she she was so it was so much magic. Um, uh, getting back to Domino, funny story. Mm. I mean, I'm I'm on a picture on a billboard in Piccadilly Square. I'm trying to get in with my missus to the Groucho Club, which you know is kind of an exclusive yeah. uh, invite. And I'm like, yeah, but my picture's right there with Kira. Look, can you not? I'm sorry, sir. Um, so. I said, well, look, uh, I'm a friend of, uh, I'm a friend of Tony Scott's. And the guy said, he's lovely, but unfortunately he's not a member here. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and so he, um, he did say that Ridley was, and if I'd like to call Ridley to speak on my behalf, I was like, oh, geez. So I've never been to the Groucho Club. But I will someday, Nick. Mark my words. You will do well. As I'm not a member myself, but oddly enough, funnily enough, during um, pandemic and lockdown, I've been there twice because I oh. have a mate who is. I'm sorry, that's rubbing it in. I really don't mean to rub it in. It's like um, it's huge on my bucket list. By the way, I've never forgot that. I've never, and it's and I go to the UK quite a bit. I have to say. If you, are, if you are over, you will like my friend, a guy called Greg. He's a really great guy. We will, Good. I'll, I'll give him a heads up and I'm sure he'd be, you know, he'd be delighted. Um, it he, was so funny because at that time I couldn't get into the Groucho Club, but I think HBO was having this very posh, magnanimous premiere for a show they were doing. I, it might've been called Empire. It might've been called Rome. I can't remember which. Uh, but James Purifoy was in it and James, uh, saw me and, you know, invited me in and we got, we got pissed in the, uh, in the pub at the, at the premiere and James and I have been good friends and worked, uh, on a couple of projects together. So I, right. I've always enjoyed him. Right. He's had a good career too. Yeah, no, he's had a very good, yes, watching him again on, on something the other day. What? you've talked about working with Rob Zombie and working with Tone. How do you, because as an actor question, how do you approach a script? How, what, do you have a process? You know? Yeah. For, you, you, you read, you know, you read the script and, and where are my lines, but it's so much more than that. You, you must read the script and 
and read it for its own sake. And my first thought is, what is the story? What is it that this story and how does, how does it move me just as a human in, in essence? How does the story affect me? And, and like somebody in need of help, how can I, how can I serve this story? How, how do I help it? And that's the very first thing. And then uh, I am informed by the story and how that I can serve it. And then I go to work on the service to that story. Now, that comes with years of experience because when you're a young actor, it's like, what are my lines? How can I peacock and make myself stand out in this story? Oh, I only have one scene. I better, you know, and, and you'll learn that you're so much better served and just serving the story. And that's, that's very stage worthy. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, your countrymen are excellent at telling stories because you serve the story because Mr. Shakespeare wrote them to be served and in everyone's service. And so you're, you're quite adept at that. So we're learning a little bit more. We're, we're very bravado as Americans, but um, through experience, you get a little bit more into the, Ego less, let me, let me, and that's when your work gets really good because it's, it's right and it's true. So I, I look for that and I look for story and if the story's there and there's a place for me to serve the story, then I'm very excited and I go into what I call the discovery process, which is um, I start doing research on this, this character's vocation, this character's uh, place of origin, this character's speak, this character's physicality, particularly. Now, what uh, also one of the interesting things, uh, Michael Cutlets, who's a really lovely actor, has this great saying, I am how I'm drawn. And I'm five foot 10, 160. So if I'm playing a big guy, I can't do much about that. I'm not putting on platform shoes or you know a fat suit if I can use that word. Um, so I'm going to take the big guy and put him in Lou somehow or another. And that's also part of experience. What is it that Lou brings to this character uh, as opposed to what does this character bring to Lou? And so uh, I go to work in that regard and I do this discovery, which is building this character and all the nuance. What's, this, what's the music he listens to? What's the food that, that he eats? Um, you know, and uh, it starts to evolve into uh, have this really lush backstory that doesn't precede the character when it shows on, on set, but it supports the character so that there's this foundation. And if somebody asks a question, why do you do that? Well, because his father abused him as a child in Noel Klug's incidents for Rob Zombie's Halloween. Um, you know, the one character I've had difficulty with is Rob Zombie's 31, the psycho head. Didn't really have a lot of answers for, for why uh, it's so violent, so mean-spirited. And uh, I was continually searching where I just had to throw it out there in frustration and anger. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I really go to school on the scripts. And then it's you know, you'd like to say, well, the director is always has care, but they've got so much going on. They're director, writer, producers nowadays, and, and they're casting and they're supervising wardrobe and color palette, makeup and camera and shot composition. So you better, I had an acting teacher that said, always pack your own shoot. In other words, you're going to jump out of an airplane, Nick. When you pull that ripcord, you better know pots and pans aren't flying out. There's a parachute in there. So I always try to be super prepared. And um, so, yeah, so when I get a script like Unstoppable, my imagination lends itself to the story, the stuff that, the, the things that aren't on the page, like this guy could be the hero. This guy can really be the hero if he lands on the front end, a lucky time and place where he can go chase this train on this given day, the thing that he always wanted to do and now he's not so sure he's in the truck that he can do it. All that stuff starts to marinate in my imagination until we can, we can make it real, alive. Right. And, uh, right. and so that's, that's what I do. And that's exciting. That's exciting by myself in my office. The movie is so good. 
sometimes better than the movie that I end up going to do. Uh, <laughs> but but you, you have to uh, you have to work with it's a collaborative uh, experience, is it not? Yeah. Yeah. I, do, do you write these notes down? Yes. So you look at my scripts and they're just crazy. And uh, I write them down because a little bit for reference, but also because I think if I write them, they are so they're real, they're visceral. And I can see a word on a script. I can see a sentence on a script and my cognitive sensibility goes right to, oh, that's what that means. That's the thinking. That's the sound of that. That's the feeling of that. I know what that is. There's a secret there that no one else knows. I know, and I'm going to, I'm going to bring that. And so, yeah, I do. Um, and that's what the work is. That's my favorite part, Nick. I don't actually enjoy the performance. I don't actually enjoy the, the filming, but I love, I love the prep preparation. I love the research. I love the discovery process. That's what turns me on. I mean, it's called fishing, right? Not catching. It's called hide and go seek, not hide and go find. What's under the bed is what gets us uh, excited, you know? And so I think that's human nature. That's why we tell stories. That's why we love listening to stories. And so I keep that in mind and everything I try to do. That, that is absolutely, you've reminded me of Alfred Hitchcock, who said exactly the same thing. He loved all the storyboarding, the script, and he, he wanted Xerox, the company, to, you know, to create a machine where he could feed a script in one end and it would produce a film at the other. That's beautiful, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he didn't really enjoy going on set and so on. Now, one of the things I did want to touch on is uh, some more recent stuff, and that is you took on a producer role on Time and Craft as the treasurer of... Pro I can't even say it now. <laughs> Long title. I'd like to, you just time crafters. I'd like to just whack that last part out. There is a treasure. It does end up in Pirate's Cove, but it's time crafters, which is, uh, you know, a reference to time traveling pirates. And already I've got your interest, right? I mean, now we're in the Goonies sensibility and I've been knowing about this script for a long time. Rick Spall, the writer, director, and I, had been talking about this forever. His producing partner, Craig Albrecht, the three of us really were focused. And it was on again, off again. And I was always going to play Professor Ratliff. Uh, but at some point, to get these kinds of things done, you have to take massive action, to coin a phrase used by Tony Robbins, the motivational speaker, massive action. And so massive action was calling a gentleman that I'd worked with and someone I consider a friend, the great Malcolm McDowell, one of your countrymen and one of your, your treasures, but the world's treasures, cinematic treasures. And would you, could you be part of this as the, you know, the treacherous Captain Lynch, our, our pirate, our, you know, pirate captain and and through Chris Rowe, our good friend, we were able to, to make, to parlay that deal, if you will. And, uh, and that got our movie going. Oh, you've got Malcolm McDowell. Well, now you're serious. Now we can talk. Yeah, let's go. And now Denise Richards says, oh, Malcolm's doing it. I, I might be interested in Eric Balfour then. And so the, the wheel starts to turn when you get a hub like Malcolm in the mix. And Chris was a vital part of that as well, obviously. Uh, with his working with Malcolm and their relationships. So, um, and Malcolm's great. He, he's, he's everything that you always expect or, or hope for as a pirate. And, uh, and so this is great. And it really does center on our 12 year olds. There's five of them and they're, uh, I, I wanted to be engaged in a project that, that was rather wholesome, you know, that had something for the kids and and to be able to uh, present it and and, um, and I'm proud of it producing is is work as well it's it's putting people together it's uh it's saying it's an awful lot of let me see let me try don't count me out yet let me see and get back to you there's a lot <laughs> there's a lot of uh, uh how are we going to do this 
but we must. And so I think that that was a great experience for me that I'd like to continue to do that um, because I think I have a skill set that lends itself to that through observation, uh, through experience, through people skills, um, in conversation and, uh, and, and actually knowing this industry pretty well. I think that uh, I would like to continue to pursue producing. I like to write. I probably would prefer to do that even more and at some point direct, although as you can tell, I'm quite verbose. And I think the economy of our day would not be well served with me talking through each direction. <laughs> yeah. yeah, having I directed three short films and um, I l really learned how to just like, to say it very clearly, Nick, and then shut up. And just listen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I would. It's I'd need some notes on that. You, you <laughs> might. You might have to give me some some sure. uh, some help with that. Yeah, I think I think it's mostly summed up in the fact you have one of those and two of those, and you're supposed to use them in that kind of proportion. I think. Yeah. Oh my okay. gosh. Yeah. yeah. That's, nicely. That's it's perverse. <laughs> what, um, where can people see uh, Time You can see Time Crafters uh, on several streaming platforms, but uh, very specifically on Amazon Prime. And uh, um, it's, it's really fun. It's a good family adventure. That's what we were going for. And that's what we delivered. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud of it. So I think right. there's never enough pirate movies. And, um, you know, we want to see pirates. Yeah, yeah, of course. And particularly, we want to see Malcolm McDowell playing a pirate because <laughs> he he's, looks great. I've watched the trailer. I haven't had a chance to see the film, but he, he looks He's great. lovely. He's yeah. lovely. And our young our young cast does fantastic, uh, headed up by Casey Simpson. And uh, they're, 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 they're really good, and they do a right. great job, and they carry the film. And the rest of us are there to serve it and do right. And do really well. So we've got we've got a swashbuckling hero and Eric Balfour, and you know we've got some comedy re relief in our goofy pirates and and a sort of a double crossing foil in my character and uh, with the big you know the black top hat and um, uh, we've got all manner of uh, stereotypes in it to be to to be honest. Right, right, right. Uh, that, yeah, that's what you want. That is exactly what you want. Now the other land. Film the other film I know we were talking about um, before we came on air, and that's um, The Endless, um, directed by the wonderful Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead, uh, who I happened to be, you know, beginning of last year, I was with them up in Glasgow. How did you get involved uh, with these guys? It's so interesting. Um, there's a casting director who I, I like very much. There's so many of them. You know, the casting director is the conduit to the director or the production who knows the talent and brings the talent in for the meeting based on, I think this talent helps serve your story. Uh, this particular casting director, Mark Bennett, had brought me in for a script that I adored and read for. And when I say read for auditioned, People think, well, you don't audition after you've done all this, but the truth is you, you really do. Um, you can choose not to, but that just keeps you out of the game. So I read for a movie called Under the Silver Lake and Mark sent a message to my agents and they called and they said, hey, you, um, we've got a job for you. And I was like, oh, great, from Mark Bennett, it's the Under the Silver Lake. And they're like, no, no, it's not that. That director actually has no interest in you. <laughs> and so... Uh, I was a little bummed out, but these two boys wanted to come and meet me and Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead uh, as gentlemen came to my house and sat with me in, in my library and looked through all of my wife's books and knew most of them and very well versed and well thought young man and presented their pitch to me about this movie they were doing and they didn't actually know the breadth of the role that I was going to be playing. They talked about a man who'd been lost in time, uh, a, a kind of a ecologist wilderness guy in the form of maybe John Muir, uh, Big Beard and Scot Scotsman. And it was really vague. And they said, we don't know, but we need you. Actually, they didn't say that. They said, we don't need you, but we want you. And I was like, oh, 
it's so bizarre, but something instinctively, having worked with Rob Zombie, having worked with Tony Scott, uh, ha having worked uh, with Alejandro Inaratu, um, Alphonse Cuaron, there was something that told me about these two have that it as directors. And you learn to gauge this pretty quickly. And they piqued that interest that I must find out if there's truth to this. Yeah, I'll do it. And we went and did a very small project in San Diego County out at a, uh, a remote location and really made something to the point where it was for the longest time, 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. I think it's 94 now where it was deemed the best science fiction movie of 2018, I think. And it just started to get its attention in 2019 when Netflix picked it up for the pandemic, uh, where uh, people like Richard Linkletter or uh, Peter Jackson um, were, were, were saying, this is the perfect Lovecraftian story. It just got so much attention and such a good, well-crafted storytelling movie that I was very proud to be part of it. And I essentially, I'm the red, a red herring in it. I do very little uh, except what I'm supposed to, how I served the story. It was great. And I love these two boys because they are film enthusiasts. You've been around them, you know this. Mm. They just soon talk about someone else's film as theirs. They're so supportive. They love attending these film festivals and, and, and supporting everyone's. They just like making movies. Uh, and, and they're going to overcome the system that's going to tell them how to make movies. They're, they're going to be the two guys that hold to their guns and do really captivating work. So I'm pleased to have been part of it. Someday they're going to hatch on the world and an Aleister Crowley story that's just going to blow our minds, right? Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, so all this is, is really exciting and, yeah. and uh, I enjoyed working on The Endless so much. And I, I would have your entire audience check it out if you really want to, you know, have some questions, question yeah. your mind. It's yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally support that. I've seen it myself and it's just extraordinary. And they are, they, as you say, you've described them so aptly because they are, they're enthusiasts, they're incredibly good company um, because they just love film. And they know so they much it. about it as well. You know, just really, really interesting, as you say, filmmaking. Because the other one, the most recent one, is the syn is Synchronic, um, which we uh, watched right. up in Glasgow yeah. last year. And again, it's very strange, Jamie Dorman, yeah. um, and very strange. Now, we are more or less at the end, but before I let you go, if I may, I'd really like to ask you some luggage in the crypt questions. Ah. Wow, those are those are <laughs> tough questions, but yeah, they are. I, everyone struggles with them, so please don't feel it's bad. It's so funny because I, I, you know, as you ask the question, and, and again, uh, well, let me let you ask the question so that the audience has a point of reference, and I'm clear on your point of reference. Then I'll comment on it and give you an answer. Okay, okay. So, as I say. The idea is that we are trying to find something for you to take into the afterlife with you. You kind of big thing. So, first choice: what film do you think you might take with you? Ah, interesting. Um, you're going to find this strange, uh, or probably not, because you've had so many guests that I can't even imagine what everyone's answer might be. My film is going to be. It's a wonderful life. And uh, I'm going to happily take it with me for the lesson, uh, for the statement that in fact it has been. And, um, and that no man with friends is a failure. And, uh, and I will be one of those men. Uh, yeah, I don't think anyone has. Uh, I don't think anyone has chosen it before. I don't remember anybody else choosing it. That's a great choice. As a thank you. A, yeah, that's a really, really nice choice. Choice, and I can immediately. I'm hearing the bell ringing at the end of the. And Clarence oh. getting yeah 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 absolutely. that's perfect. Isn't yeah, it? The, the the moments and the running down the street and the yeah 
yeah, I'm getting goosebumps now just thinking. Yeah, about it. it's yeah. beautiful. It's yeah, beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. What about a film? Oh, sorry, what about a book? What book would you oh, take? Oh, interesting. You? Well, I'm, you know, I like to be well prepared. You know this about me. I like to do my study. Uh, and so I'm going to hope that I've got or I will uh, have good use of a service manual for when I get to heaven. So I will be taking the Bible with me. And again, I think that's one I've not, this, uh, you know, and again, a book that's full of really good stories. The best. Yeah. All of the stories. Yeah. 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 Yeah, really interesting choice. What about music? What sort of album would you take with you? Oh, that's uh, that's that's probably the tough the tough one because we all love all manner of sounds and sights, but uh, or music. Um, mm. I love like everybody, and and I use music so much in my work, and I ver I vary it very much. Nick, I try to have a soundtrack for every character so that it's not what Lou listens to; it's what this character listens to on a daily basis or it informs that character but um i my love uh some form of horn music because i find a lot of joy in big brash horns and horn sections so i might i might take benny goodman and if he would allow it to open up for him earth wind and fire Ah, oh, really interesting choices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. What about a favorite food or drink? Or oh, yeah. Well, I'm a big fan of rusty water, as you Brits like to refer to it. So I would definitely have a, uh, a working man's uh, bourbon uh, that that I might be able to toast and that, that these days that's bullet. If I can, if I can be, if I may be so bold, I would even ask for bullet rye. Right. Uh, and the food that I enjoy is right down in the, uh, in the Gulf coast, Louisiana, Cajun food. So that would be sort of a, a French Creole uh, crawfish etouffee. Let's call it that. Right. Right. What about um, a piece of visual art, a painting or a statue, something like that? Yeah, that's, that's so fantastic. I've just returned from New York where I saw a lot of art. And, you know, if you let it in, most of us don't let art inform ourselves. We're a little nervous that it's making us feel this way and we move on to the next painting or we are on a clock. But if you really let art talk to you, uh, it will it will grab you. Um, anything that I've referenced um, by by Van Gogh, I feel like is is perfect because there's the colors are so bright and yet there's some inherent sadness. It's kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, um, what's more fun than that? Uh, there's a statue of Mr. Rogers uh, at a small college in Florida, and there's a bunch of children around him. And, and I stared at that for a long time. I liked it. I don't know if those are good answers. Those are, uh, those are hey, every every answer is a right answer as far as I'm concerned. I you know, I think I may have I would say it. as I take this drink of Starbucks, and I do like Starbucks because I, I like the richness of uh, I do need good good coffee for wherever I'm going. So a good French press is important to me as well. Okay. Okay. So I think probably that I'd make that your luxury in that case, having a, a, okay. a, a concert. That might, that would be my guilty pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> and if somebody could stir in, if somebody could stir in and, and, and serve a little bananas foster, man, we're, we are in heaven. I in fact have <laughs> made it to heaven. Right. <laughs> I'm sure there will be some sort of somebody on hand 
to you my know, comments on your questions are so mm. interesting is, is my knee jerk reaction is that you've had so many guests and this question comes to you and we've all probably I'm going to say you've had a lot of guests that have presented or portrayed going into the afterlife through a death scene okay and mm. we, we all rather think of in the moment how am I going to die but seldom do we think about after the moment you know um you know when, when I'm dead I'm getting out of wardrobe and I'm going to eat um and what would we take you know I've never really been presented it's a beautiful question and uh and I'm curious if if uh if anyone's ever answered like if you had Harry Dean Stanton he'd say well Nick you, you can't take you know you can't take it with you there's nothing you're just you're, nothing is in the crib you know if it's if someone else put it there uh whereas gee someone else you know Dennis Hopper would probably say, well, I need most of my art and I need that book that got me in the argument with Marlon Brando and, and on, you know, uh, Apocalypse Now. And I mean, it, yeah, it's got to be very diverse in the in the ideology of it. Yes. Yes. Well, that um, which is why I kind of always phrased it like that is because it's like trying to find out what influences yeah. people. Yeah, what, what, it's great. What questions. inspires? What what inspires yeah. people? It's always, it's, you know, it's always. I suppose in some ways, like, where do you get your ideas from? Is what uh, authors are often asked, and it's like, yeah, actually, I think these things are things that inspire us. And that's Who we are? So yeah, I definitely am taking those into the afterlife and believe they'll be with me. I do, uh, you know, and happily. Mm. So I don't think that. Uh, you know, I'm born naked and leaving naked at, by any stretch of the imagination. You know, mm. uh, I think um, I think that dotted line, that that dash between date of birth and date of death, is your life where you lived, and it's so s specific, but it's huge. If you were to, you know, the dates are. Mm. irrelevant but the, yeah. that dash is everything and yeah. it's the same dash as winston churchill it's the same dash as cromwell it's the same dash as, as whoever you you know look up to it's it's a life and so yeah. uh, it's a great question nick thank you thank for you asking. thank you well I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it um, we've talked for ages, um, and I really should Great. let you go. <laughs> yeah, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed good. a good, a good chin wag. <laughs> that is so English. <laughs> is it? Uh, well, as you know, I'm married to uh, uh, my, my missus is a Brit, and so um, picks up uh, references. So uh, we still pick up the post. Uh, we still Hoover. Um, we uh, we do toss things in the bin. Uh, we might go to the boot to get our 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 baggage. We eat uh, crisps in the form of what we call chips. Chips might be what we call cookies. Uh, when I say we as Americans, uh, there's a lot of the terms that we've taken on as a household. Uh, we play football. The UK just played for the championship football. Uh, different than American football, obviously. Yeah. Um, we have sayings like, uh, how's your father? Uh, and uh, change is as good as the rest. Or uh, uh, I, I could go on and on. Could, but yeah, yeah we, we, we've taken in quite a few. And occasionally, I'll let one slip in my work. And, I'll be, and they'll be like, hey, that doesn't sound very Southern colloquial. And I'm like, yeah, it wasn't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I think it's a it's a hearty mix because it all it all starts at uh, at your country, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Lou, this has been as you said, well for me too, incredibly enjoyable. Thank you very much indeed, sir. I'll let Thank you, get you. On the rest of the day, and uh, hopefully see you in person. Well, when I come over to the UK, we'll make it so at the very least for a, uh, a rendezvous at the Groucho Club. And then uh, maybe we'll we'll head over to Scotland and and try some of their peaty water uh, with your uh, 
with your family, your, yeah. your, your partner's family. So thank yeah. you so much. Bless you, all the audience. Thanks for tuning in to the chattering hour. It's well worth it. It's well worth the hour that is uh, afforded you. And thanks for doing what you do, Nick, because it, uh, it serves us all, particularly in the times when we just need the comfort of conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, sir. My thanks again to Lou Temple. What a lovely man he is. Join me next week for some more tales from the world of horror, thriller and suspense. And in the meantime, stay safe and well.